Do a redeem for a live howl. <laughs> anyway, hopefully, shit will work tonight. <laughs> so far, everything is. Well, it still isn't really following my mouth all that well. Hopefully, if and when I ever get a new model, it'll work better. Hopefully. As it is, I'm still doing this from my phone and transmitting it to my computer for... Ah... For some reason, the model on my computer doesn't animate as well as the one on my phone. Well, last night, my phone wasn't even working with it. But, I hope you've had a good week. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Stream earlier, I don't know where I was. Probably not in my head, which is normal for me lately. <sighs> so, what are your plans for the night? Other than listening to me ramble to myself. <laughs> oh, I don't remember. We were going to start with a long fairy tale tonight, weren't we? Oh, maybe. No, it's Danish. I don't think I've read this one before. That'll be interesting. Work as always, huh? I wouldn't know anything about that. I haven't worked for three years now. Unless you count this. My parents are the hell done. <laughs> And the cold weather is finally starting to get to me. I'm getting sleepier earlier. I've actually started waiting until the next morning to edit the videos instead of doing it at night. Which I guess is a good thing. But I have been doing a lot more editing just so I can interact with people more when I'm streaming. I do already have my tree up, see? <laughs> uh, I can't wait until I get this computer built. Then I can have a little bit more reliable streams. There's a young goose in the chat, as opposed to an old goose. I think the young goose is a annoying looking badger, something like that. It's supposed to be a mongoose. But yes, it is Friday night, and Friday night is the time for fairy tales.
because, you know, fairy tales are important. And Kale is advertising my books of fairy tales. Feel free to buy one. <laughs> Honestly, if you get the autographed copy, I'm the one sending it out, so I can do other notes and stuff in it. Yeah, I just have the autographed ones on that listing. Oh, the young goose got away. Damn it. Oh well. Anyway, let's see if my other scenes are working. I really did go through and test this stuff earlier. And I'm gone. <laughs> uh, there I am. I think I was setting it up to make sure it. Nope. That's not the one I wanted. Okay. Yeah, this is one. But I was setting up to make sure I had both my PNG reactive working and my regular one working in case it decided to you know, fuck off again. Oh, look. The ad for book two. My chat is going to be entirely ads, apparently. So if I miss any messages in chat, I apologize, but I gotta make money somehow. And honestly, I haven't sold a single copy of Book 2 yet. Which is really kind of sad. Because this is the one that I had the mo more fun with. Because I was actually doing my own translations and everything else in it too. And eventually I'm going to try to just make another copy with my sketches in it. I don't know what I'd do if I did an illustrated version. Which is really kind of weird because I asked my sister and my niece if they wanted to draw for it. And then I never got anything from either one of them. But my niece apparently is commissioned for paintings online. And it's like, oh well. At least she has a job. She's made more money this year than I have. <laughs> what time is it? 9.09. Okay, it's almost time to start reading. But again, we are reading from the Pink Fairy Book. Which is the fifth book in the Coward Fairy Book. The Coward Fairy Book stories. Yeah. The Color Fairy Book books. Yeah. Not enough, there are 13 that are just fairy books. <laughs> so I'm going to try to get through all of them on these things. And it'll probably be really boring because you'll start noticing that fairy tales from different countries sound a lot alike. And let me check something real quick. Uh, da -da. Go to my YouTube channel. If it'll let me. I have 133 subscribers on YouTube. I don't think I'm going to make 150 this year. 
Okay, I go to YouTube Studio. And I'm going to look at my Andrew Lang fairy book stories. And I will tell you how many from this one group that I have read. So playlists, Andrew Lang fairy books. It says I have 160. That is this playlist right here. 160 stories in it so far. Not counting, well, I guess it's including the five prefaces that I did for each of the book. So I have read a lot of fairy tales. And these are just the Andrew Lang books. That's not counting the Jack Zide ones I've read. So I have a lot of stories if you ever need fairy tales to listen to and I'm not streaming. Check my YouTube channel. Because they're all there anyway. <clears throat> but anyway, we're oddly already running behind. <laughs> So let me crack open the book, and everybody can settle back and relax, except for Guilty, because he's on his way to work. <laughs> Make sure my microphone is where it belongs, and we will get into our first story for this fabulous Friday night of fairy tales. <clears throat> and as I said, the first story for tonight is a Danish tale. And oddly enough, not by Hans Christian Andersen. He's not the only author in that area. Crazy, huh? And anyway, the first story is The Princess in the Chest. There were once a king and queen who lived in a beautiful castle and had a large and fair and rich and happy land to rule over. From the very first they loved each other greatly and lived very happily together. But they had no heir. They had been married for seven years and had neither son nor daughter, and that was a great grief to both of them. More than once it had happened that when the king was in a bad temper, he let it out on the poor queen, and said that they were now getting old, and neither they nor the kingdom had an heir, and it was all her fault. This was hard to listen to, and she went and cried and vexed herself. Finally, the king said to her one day, This can't be born any longer. I am about to childless and it's your fault i am going to journey and shall be away for a year if you have a child when i come back all will be well and i shall love you beyond all measure and never say an angry word to you but if the nest is just as empty when i come home then i must part with you So did he just openly say, I'm going to go away for a year. If you get pregnant while I'm gone, it's cool. Interesting fairy tale so far. <clears throat> anyway. After the king had set out on his journey, the queen went about in her loneliness and sorrowed and vexed herself more than ever. At last her maid said to her one day, I think that some help can be found if your majesty would seek it. Then she told her about a wise old woman in the country who had many troubles helped in her past of the same kind and could no doubt help the queen as well. 
if she would send for him. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. The queen did so, and the wise woman came, and to her she confided her sorrow, that she was childless, and the king and his kingdom had no heir. The wise woman knew help for this. Out in the king's garden, she said, under the great oak stands on the left hand, just as one goes out from the castle, is a little bush, rather brown than green, with hairy leaves and long spikes. On that bush there are just at this moment three buds. If your majesty goes out there alone, fasting, before sunrise, and takes the middle one of the three buds and eats it, then in six months you will bring a princess into the world. As soon as she is born, she must have a nurse whom I shall provide, and this nurse must live with a child in a secluded part of the palace. No other person must visit the child. Neither the king nor the queen must see until she is fourteen years old, for that would cause great sorrow and misfortune. The queen rewarded the old woman richly, and next morning, before the sun rose, she was down in the garden and found at once a little bush with the three buds, plucked the middle one, and ate it. It was sweet to taste, but afterwards was bitter as gall. Six months after this, she brought into the world a little girl. The nurse was in readiness, whom the wise woman had provided, and preparations were made for her living with the child, quite alone, in a secluded wing of the castle, looking out on the pleasure park. The queen did as the wise woman had told her, and gave up the child immediately, and the nurse took it and lived with it there. When the king came home, he heard that a daughter had been born to him, and, of course, he was very pleased and happy, and wanted to see her at once. The queen then had to tell him this much of the story, that it had been foretold that it would cause great sorrow and misfortune if either he or she got sight of the child until it had completed its fourteenth year. This was a long time to wait. The king longed so much to get a sight of his daughter, and the queen no less than he, but she knew that it was not like other children for it could speak immediately after it was born, and was wise as older folk. This the nurse had told her, for with her the queen had a talk now and then, and there was no one who had ever seen the princess. The queen also had seen that a wise woman could do, so she insisted strongly that her warning should be obeyed. The king often lost his patience and was determined to see his daughter, but the queen always put him off the idea, and so things went on until the very day before the princess completed her fourteenth year. Now the king and queen were out in the garden then, and the king said, No, I can't wait. I won't wait any longer. I must see my daughter at once. A few hours, more or less, can't make any difference. The queen begged him to have patience till the morning. When they had waited so long, they could surely wait a single day more. But the king was quite unreasonable. No nonsense, he said. She is just as much mine as yours, and I will see her. And with that, he went straight up to her room. No, honestly, if you think about it, the king didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, he burst open the door and pushed aside the nurse who tried to stop him, and there he saw his daughter. She was the loveliest young princess, red and white like milk and blood, with clear blue eyes and golden hair, but right in the middle of her forehead there was a little tuft 
of brown hair. The princess went to meet her father and fell on his neck and kissed him, but with that she said, Oh, father, father, what have you done now? Tomorrow I must die, and you chose one of three things. Either the land must be smitten with a black pestilence, or you must have a long and bloody war, or as soon as I am dead, lay me plain in a wooden chest, and set it in the church, and for a whole year place a sentinel beside it every night. Okay. The king was frightened indeed, and though he thought she was raving, but in order to please her, he said, Well, ooh, of these three things, I shall choose the last. If you die, I shall lay you at once in a plain wooden chest, and have it set in the church, and every night I shall place a sentinel beside it. But you shall not die, even if you are ill now. He immediately summoned all the best doctors in the country, and they came with all their prescriptions and their bottled medicines. And the next day, the princess was stiff and cold in death. All the doctors could certify to that, and they all put their names to this and appealed their seals. And when they had done all they could, the king kept his promise. The princess's body was laid the same day in a plain wooden chest and set in the chapel of the castle, and on that night and every night after it, a sentinel was posted in the church to keep watch over the chest. The first morning when they came to let the sentinel out, there was no sentinel there. They thought he had just gotten frightened and ran away, and next evening when the new one was posted in the church. In the morning, he was also gone. So it went every night. When they came in in the morning to let the sentinel out, there was no one there, and it was impossible to discover which way he had gone, if he had run away. And what should they run away for? Every one of them, so that nothing more was ever heard or seen of them, from the hour that they were set on guard beside the princess's chest. It became now a general belief that the princess's ghost walked and ate up all those who were guarding the chest, and very soon there was no one left who would be placed on this duty, and the king's soldiers deserted the service before their turn came to be her bodyguard. The king then promised a large reward to the soldier who would volunteer for the post. This did good for some time, as there were a few found a bit reckless, who wished to earn this really good payment. But they never got it, for in the morning, they too had disappeared like the rest. So it had gone on for something like a whole year. Every night a sentinel had been placed beside the chest, either by compulsion or on his own free will. But not a single one of the sentinels was ever to be seen, either on the following day or any time thereafter. And so it had gone on with one, and on the night before a certain day, when a merry young smith came wandering to the town where the king's castle stood. It was the capital of the country, and people of every king came to it to get work. The smith, whose name was Christian, had come for that same purpose. There was no work for him in the place he belonged to, and now he wanted to seek a place in the capital. There he entered an inn, where he sat down in the public room, and got something to eat. Some under-officers were sitting there, who were out to try to get someone enlisted to stand in sentry. They had to go in in this way, day after day, and hitherto they had always succeeded in finding one or other reckless fellow. But on this day they had, as yet, found no one. It was too well known how all the sentinels disappeared, who were set on in the posts, and all they had got hold of had refused with thanks. These sat down beside Christian, and ordered drinks, and drank along with him. Now, 
Christian was a merry fellow who liked good company, and he could both drink and sing, and talk and boast as well. And when he got a little drop in his head, he told these under-officers that he was one of a kind of folk that were never afraid of anything. Then he was just before uh, he was a day older. Go oh, on, let's get this apart. Never afraid of anything. Then he was just the kind of man they liked, they said, and he might easily earn a good penny before he was a day older. For the king paid a hundred dollars to anyone who would stand as sentinel in the church at night beside his daughter's chest. Christian was not afraid of that. He wasn't afraid of anything. So they drank another bottle of wine on this, and Christian went with them up to the colonel, where he was put into uniform with a musket. And all the rest, and then was shut up in church to stand as sentinel for the night. It was eight o'clock when he took up the post, and for the first hour he was quite proud of his courage. During the second hour, he was well pleased with the large reward that he would get. But in the third hour, when it was getting near eleven, the effects of the wine had passed off, and he began to get uncomfortable, for he had heard about this post that no one had ever escaped alive from it, so far as was known. But neither did anyone know what had become of all the sentinels. The thought of this ran in his head so much, especially after the wine was out of it, that he searched about everywhere for a way to escape. And finally, at eleven o'clock, he found a little postern in the steeple, which was not locked, and out of this he crept, intending to run away. At the same moment as he put his foot outside the church door, he saw standing before him a little man who said, Good morning, Christian. Where are you going? With that, he felt as if he were rooted to the spot and could not move. Nowhere, said he. Oh, yes, said the little man. You were just about to run away, but you have taken upon you to stand sentinel in the church tonight, and there you must stay. Christian said very humbly that he dared not, and therefore wanted to get away, and begged to be let go. No, said the little one, you must remain at your post, but I shall give you a good piece of advice. You shall go up into the pulpit and remain standing there. You need never mind what you see or hear. It will not be able to do you any harm if you remain in your place until you hear the lid of the chest slam down again behind the dead. Then all danger is past, and you can go about the church wherever you please. The little man then pushed him in at the door again and locked it after him. Christian made haste to get up to the pulpit and stood there without noticing anything until the clock struck twelve. Then the lid of the princess's chest sprang up, and out of it there came something like the princess, dressed, as you can see in this picture, that you can't see because I don't have it. It shrieked and howled. Sentry, where are you? Sentry, where are you? If you don't come, you shall get the most cruel death anyone has ever got. It went all around the church, and when it finally caught sight of the smith up on the pulpit, it came rushing there and mounted the steps. But it could not get the whole way up, and for all of that it stretched and strained, it could not touch Christian who meanwhile stood and trembled up in the pulpit. When the clock struck one, the appearance had to go back into the chest again, and Christian heard the lid slam after it. After this, there was dead silence in the church. He lay down where he was and fell asleep, and did not awake before it was bright daylight, and he heard steps outside, and the noise of a key being put into the lock. 
Then he came down from the pulpit and stood with his musket in front of the princess's chest. It was the colonel himself who came with the patrol, and he was not a, but a little surprised when he found the recruits safe and sound. He wanted to have a report, but Christian would give him none. So he took him straight up to the king and announced for the first time that here was the sentinel who had stood guard in the church overnight. The king immediately got out of bed and laid a hundred dollars on him on the table, and then wanted to question him. Have you seen anything? he said. Have you seen my daughter? I stood at my post, said the young smith, and that is quite enough. I undertook nothing more. He was not sure whether he dared tell what he had seen and heard. Besides, he was also a little conceited because he had done what no other man had been able to do or had had the courage for. The king professed to be quite satisfied and asked him whether he would engage himself to stand guard again on the following night. No, thank you, said Christian. I will have no more of that. As you please, said the king. You have behaved like a brave fellow, and now you shall have your breakfast. You must be needed something to strengthen you after that turn. The king had breakfast laid for him and sat down at the table with him in person. He kept constantly filling his glass for him and praising him and drinking his health. Christian needed no pressing, but he did his full justice on both food and drink, and not the least to the latter. Finally, he grew bold and said that if the king would give him two hundred dollars for it, he was his man to send sentry the next night as well. When this was arranged, Christian bade him good day and went to town among the guards and then out to the town along the other soldiers and under officers. He had his pocket full of money and treated them and drank with them and boasted and made game for all good for nothings who were afraid to stand on guard because they were frightened that the dead princess would eat them. <laughs> See whether she had eaten him. So the day passed in mirth and glee, but when eight o'clock came, Christian was once again shut up in the church, all alone. Before he had been there two hours, he got tired of it and thought only of getting away. He found the little door behind the altar, which was not locked, and at ten o'clock he slipped out at and took to his heels and made for the beach. He had got halfway there when all at once a little man stood in front of him and said, Good evening, Christian. Where are you going? I have leave to go where I please, said the smith, but at the same time he noticed that he could not move a foot. No, you have undertaken to keep God tonight as well, he said the little man. And you must attend to that. He then took hold of him. However unwilling he was, Christian had to go with him right back to the same little door that he had crept out at. When they got there, the little man said to him, Go in front of the altar now and take in your hand the book that is lying there. There you shall stay till you hear the lid of the chest slam down over the dead. That's the way you will come to no harm. With that, the little man shoved him in the door and locked it. Christian then immediately went in front of the altar and took the book in his hand and thus stood until the clock struck twelve. And the appearance sprang out of the chest. Sentry, where are you? Sentry, where are you? It shrieked, and then it rushed to the pulpit and right up into it. But there was no one there that night. Then it howled and shrieked again. My father has set no sentry in. War and pest this night begin. At the same moment, it noticed the smith standing in front of the altar and came rushing towards him. Are you there? It screamed. Now I'll catch you. But it could not come over the step in front of the altar. There it continued to howl and scream and threaten until the clock struck one. Then it had to go into the chest again, and Christian heard the lids slam above it. 
That night, however, it had not the same appearance as the previous one. It was less ugly. When all was quiet in the church, the smith lay down before the altar and slept calmly until the following morning, when the colonel came to fetch him. He was taken up to the king again, and things went on as the day before. He got his money and would give no explanation whether he had seen the king's daughter, and he would not take the post again, he said. But after he had a good breakfast and tasted well of the king's wines, he undertook to go on guard again the third night, but he would not do it for less than half the kingdom, he said, for it was a dangerous post, and the king had to agree and promise him this. The remainder of the day went like the previous one. He played the boastful soldier and the merry smith, and he had comrades and boon companions aplenty. At eight o'clock, he had to be put on his uniform again, and he was shut up in the church. He had not been there for an hour before he had come to his senses and thought, It's best to stop now while the game is going well. The third night, he was sure, would be the worst. He had been drunk when he promised it, and half the kingdom. Uh, the king could never have been earnest about that, so he decided to leave without waiting so long on the previous nights. And that way he would escape the little man who had watched him before. All of the doors and posterns were locked, but he finally threw a creeping up to a window, and opening that, and as the clock struck nine, he crept out. It was fairly high in the wall, but he had got to the ground with no broken bones, and he started to run. He got down to the shore without meeting anyone, and there he got into a boat and pushed it from land. He laughed immensely to himself at the thought of how cleverly he had managed and how he had cheated the little man. Just then he heard a voice from shore. Good evening, Christian. Where are you going? He gave no answer. Tonight your legs will be too short, he thought, and pulled at the oars. But then he felt something lay a hold of the boat and drag it straight into shore, for all that he sat and struggled with the oars. The man then laid hold of him and said, You must remain at your post as you have promised. And whether he liked it or not, Christian had to go just back with him the whole way to the church. He would never get in that window again, Christian said. It was far too high up. You must go in there, and you shall go in there, said the little man. And with that, he lifted him up to the window sill, then said to him, Notice now well that you have to do. This evening you must stretch yourself out on the left-hand side of her chest. When the lid opens to the right, she comes out to the left. When she has got out of the chest and passed over you, you must get into it and lie there, and that in a hurry, without her seeing you. There you must remain lying until day dawns, and whether she threatens you or entreats you, you must not come out of it or give her any answer. Then she has no power over you, and both you and she are freed. The smith then had to go on at the window, just as he had come out, and went and laid himself in his length at the left side of the princess's chest, and close up to it, and there he lay as stiff as a rock until twelve o'clock struck. Then the lid sprang open to the right, and the princess came out and straight over him, and rushed around the church, howling and shrieking, Sentry, where are you? Sentry, where are you? Then she went to the altar and right up to it, but there was no one there. Then she screamed again. My father has set no sentry in. War and pest will now begin. Then she went around the whole church, both up and down, sighing and weeping. My father has nested no sentry in. War and pest will now begin. Then she went away again. At the same moment, the clock in the tower struck one. 
Then the smith heard in the church a soft music, which grew louder and louder, and soon filled the whole building. He also heard multiple footsteps, as if the church was being filled with people. He heard the priest go through the service in front of the altar, and there was more singing and more beautiful than he'd ever heard before. Then he also heard the priest offer up a prayer of thanksgiving, because the land had been freed from war and pestilence and from all misfortune, and the king's daughter delivered from the evil one. Many Joyce's voices joined in, and a praise of him was a hymn of praise was sung. And then he heard the priest again, and heard his own name, and that of the princess, and thought that he was being wedded to her. The church was packed full, but he could see nothing. Then he heard again the many footsteps of people leaving the church, while the music sounded fainter and fainter, until it altogether died away. When it was silent, the light of day began to break in through the windows. The smith sprang up out of the chest and fell on his knees and thanked God. The church was empty, but up in front of the altar lay the princess, white and red, like a human being, but sobbing and crying and shaking with cold under her white shroud. The smith took her, his sentry coat and wrapped it around her, and then she dried her tears, and took his hand and thanked him and said he had now freed her from all the sorcery that had been in her from her birth, and which had come over her again when her father broke the command against seeing her until she had completed her fourteenth year. She said further that if he had delivered her, would take her in marriage, she would do this. If not, she would go into a nunnery, and he could marry no other as long as she lived, for he was wedded to her with the service of the dead, which he had heard. Now she was the most beautiful young princess that anyone could wish to see, and he was now lord of half the kingdom, which had been promised him for standing guard on the third night. So they agreed that they would have each other, and love each other all their days. With the first sunbeam, the watch came and opened the church, and not only was the colonel there, but the king in person, come to see what had happened to the sentinel. He found them both sitting hand in hand on the step in front of the altar, and immediately knew his daughter again, and took her in his arms, thanking God and her deliverer. He made no objections to what they had arranged, and so Christian the smith held his wedding with the princess, he got half the kingdom at once and the whole of it when the king died. As for the other sentries, with so many doors and windows open, no doubt they had all run away and gone into the Prussian service. As for the, what Christian said he saw, he had been drinking more wine than was good for him. <laughs> all right then. princess was a vampire or the other guys had actually run away I think she killed them all I mean she did threaten to kill him every night so Santa where are you <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so that's kind of a horror story. I like that one. <clears throat> Our next considerably less scary story from the Brothers Grimm <clears throat> The Three Brothers Once there was a man who had three sons and no other possessions beyond his house in which he lived Now, the father loved all three sons equally so that he could not make up his mind which of them he should have the house after his death 
and because he did not wish to favor any one more than the others. And he did not want to sell the house because it had belonged to his family for generations. Otherwise, he would have divided the money equally amongst them. At last, an idea struck him and said to his sons, You must all go out into the world and look about you, and each learn a trade, and then, when you return, whoever can produce the best masterpiece shall have the house. The sons were quite satisfied. The eldest wished to be a blacksmith, the second a barber, and the third a fencing master. They appointed a time when they were to return home, and then they all set out. It so happened that each found a good master, where he learned all that was necessary for his trade in the best possible way. The blacksmith had to shoe the king's horses, and thought to himself, without a doubt the house will be yours. The barber shaved the best men in the kingdom, and he too made sure that the house would be hers. The fencing master removed many a blow, but he set his teeth and would not allow himself to be troubled by them, for he thought to himself, If you are afraid of a blow, you will never get the house. When the appointed time had come, the three brothers met once more, and they sat down and discussed the best opportunity of showing off their skill. Just then a hare came running across the field towards him. Look, said the barber, here comes something in a nick of time. He seized the basin of soap, made a lather, and whilst the hare was approaching, and then, as it ran at full tilt, shaved its mustache without cutting it or injuring a single hair on its body. <laughs> I like that much indeed, said the father. Unless the others exert themselves to the utmost, the house will be yours. Soon after, they saw a man driving a carriage furiously towards him. Now, father, you shall see what I can do, said the blacksmith, and he sprang after the carriage, tore off the four shoes of the horse while it was going at the top of its speed, and shot it with four new ones without checking its pace. You are a clever fellow, said the father, and you know your trade as well as your brother. I really don't know to which of you I shall give the house. Then the third son said, Father, let me show you something. And as it was beginning to rain, he drew his sword and swung it in cross cuts above his head, so that not a drop fell on him. And the rain fell heavier and heavier, till at last it was coming down like a water spout. But he swung his sword faster and faster, and kept as dry as if he were under cover. When the father saw this, he was astonished, and said, you have produced the greatest masterpiece. The house is yours. Both the other brothers were quite satisfied and prayed him too. And they were so fond of each other that all three remained at home and plied their trades. And as they were so experienced and skillful, they earned a great deal of money. So they lived happily together until they were quite old. And when one was taken ill and died... The two others were deeply grieved that they were also taken ill and died too. And so, because they had all been so clever and so fond of each other, they were all laid in one grave. And the house was just left abandoned anyway. Ooh. Now we get into a really long story. And it is a Hans Christian Andersen, and it inspired a movie that has almost nothing to do with it. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see, what's our time looking like? Um, I think... I think I'm going to start the ads a little early before I start this one, just so that I can get through this one. In the meantime, there's a wild Durant. It's not a Jimmy Durant, but...
So I will guess do a three minute break and run ads. So I will see you after a bit. Okay, my microphone goes sprawling. <laughs> Welcome back. Hopefully, we won't go into ads. Yes, I shall hydrate. I was actually making sure I had water in my bottle for it. And a stretch. So like I said, the next story is a lot longer by Hans Christian Andersen and a movie that was supposedly based off of it, but not very well. <laughs> but that's just one of the things I just can't let go. Anyway, <clears throat> next wonderful tale on this Friday night of fairy tales. The Snow Queen.
There was once a dreadfully wicked hobgoblin. One day he was in the capital spirits because he had made a looking glass which reflected everything that was good and beautiful in such a way that it dwindled down to almost nothing. But anything that was bad and ugly stood out very clearly and looked much worse. The most beautiful landscapes looked like boiled spinach. And the best people looked repulsive or seemed to stand on their heads with no bodies. Their faces were so changed that they could not be recognized, and if anyone had a freckle, you might as well be sure that it spread over the nose and mouth. The best part of it was, said the hobgoblin, but one day the looking glass was dropped and broken to a million billion pieces or more. And now came the greatest misfortune of all, for each of the pieces was hardly as large as a grain of sand, and they flew about the world, and if anyone had a bit in his eye, there it stayed, and then he would see everything awry, or else could only see the bad sides of a case, for every tiny splinter of the glass possessed the same power that the whole glass had. Some people got the splinter in their hearts, and that was dreadful, for then it began to turn into a lump of ice. The hobgoblin laughed till his sides ached, but still the tiny bits of glass flew about, and now we will hear all about it. In a large town where there were so many people and houses that there was not room for enough for everybody to have gardens, lived two poor children. They were not brother and sister, but they loved each other just as much as if they were. Their parents lived opposite one another in two attics, and out on the leads they had put two boxes filled with flowers. There were sweet peas in them and two rose trees, which grew beautifully, and in the summer the two children were allowed to take their little chairs and sit under the roses. Then they had splendid games. In the winter, they could not do this, but then they would put hot pennies against the frozen glass planes and made round holes to look at each other through. His name was Kay. Hers was Gerda. Outside, it was snowing fast. Those are the white bees swarming, said the old grandmother. Have they a bee queen? asked the little boy, for he knew that real bees had one. Oh, to be sure, said the grandmother. She flies wherever they swarm thickest. She is larger than any of the others, and never stays upon the earth, but flies up again back into the black clouds. After midnight she flies through the streets and peeps in all the windows, and then they freeze in such pretty patterns and look like flowers. Yes, we have seen that, said both children, and they knew it was true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? asked the little girl. Just let her, cried the boy. I would put her on the stove and melt her. But the grandmother stroked his hair and told more stories. In the evening, when little Kay was going to bed, he jumped on the chair by the window and looked out to the little hole. A few snowflakes were falling outside, and one of the largest lay on the edge of one of the window boxes. The large snowflake grew larger and larger until it took the form of a maiden dressed in the finest white gauze. She was so beautiful and dainty, but all of ice, hard, bright ice. She still was alive. Her eyes glittered like two clear stars, but there was no rest or peace in them. She nodded at the window and beckoned with her hand. The little boy was frightened and sprang down from the chair. It seemed as if a great white bird had flown past the window. The next day, there was a harder frost than before. Then came the spring, then the summer, when the roses grew and smelt more beautifully than ever. 
Kay and Gerda were looking at one of their picture books. The clock in the great church tower had just struck five when Kay exclaimed, Oh, something has stung in my heart, and I've got something in my eye. The little girl threw her arms around his neck. He winked hard with both eyes. No, she could see nothing in them. I think it is gone now, he said. But it had not gone. It was one of the tiny splinters of the glass of the magic mirror, which we had heard about earlier, that had turned everything great and good reflected in it into small and ugly. And poor Kay also had a splinter in his heart, and it began to change into a lump of ice. It did not hurt him at all, but the splinter was there all the same. Why are you crying? he asked. It makes you look so ugly. There's nothing the matter with me. Just look. That rose is all slug-eaten, and this one is stunted. What ugly roses they are. And he began to pull them to pieces. Kay, what are you doing? cried the little girl. And when he saw how frank she was, he pulled off another rose and ran at his window away from the dear little Gerda. When she came later on with the picture book, he said it was only for babies, and when his grandmother told them stories, he was always interrupting with, But! And then he would get behind her and put on her spectacles and just speak, just like she did. He did this very well, and everybody laughed. Very soon he could imitate all the way the people in the street walked and talked. His games were now quite different. On a winter's day, he would take a burning glass and hold it out of his blue coat, and let the snowflakes fall on it. Look in the glass, Gerda. See how regular they are? But they were much more interesting than real flowers. Each is perfect, but they're all made according to the rule. If only they did not melt. One morning, Kay came out with his warm gloves on, and his little sled hung over his shoulder. They shouted to Gerda. I'm going to the marketplace to play with the other boys. And he went away. In the marketplace, the boldest boys often used to fasten their sleds to the carts of the farmers, and then they got a good ride. When they were in the middle of their games, there drove into a square a large sled, all white, and in it sat a figure dressed in rough white fur police with a white fur cap on. The sled drove twice around the square, and Kay fastened his little sled behind it and drove off. It went quicker and quicker into the next street, and then the driver turned around and nodded to Kay in a friendly way as if they had known each other before. Every time that Kay tried to unfasten his sled, the driver nodded again, and Kay sat still once more. Then they drove out of the town, and the snow began to fall so thickly that the little boy could not see his hand before him. And on and on they went. He quickly unfastened the cord to get loose from the big sled, but it was of no use. His little sled hung on fast, and it went on like the wind. He cried out, but nobody heard him. He was dreadfully frightened. The snowflakes grew larger and larger till they looked like great white birds. All at once they flew aside, and the large sled stood still, and the figure who was driving stood up. The fur cloak and the cap were all of snow. It was a lady, tall and slim and glittering. It was the Snow Queen. We have come at a good rate, she said, but you are almost frozen. Creep under my cloak. And she set him close to her on the sled and drew the cloak over him. He felt as though he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you cold now? she asked and kissed his forehead. The kiss was cold as ice and reached down to his heart, which was already half a lump of ice. My sled, my sled, don't forget my sled, he thought at first, and it was fastened to one of the great white birds who flew behind in the sled on its back. 
The Snow Queen kissed Kay again, and then he forgot all about little Gerda, his grandmother, and everybody at home. Now I must not kiss you any more, she said, or else I should kiss you to death. Then away they flew over forests and lakes, over sea and land. Round them whistled the cold wind, and wolves howled, and the snow hissed. Over them flew the black shrieking crows, but high up on the moon shone large and bright. And thus Kay passed to the long winter night, and the day he slept at the Snow Queen's feet. But... What happened to little Gerda when Kay did not come back? What had become of him? Nobody knew. The other boys told how they had seen him fasten a sled onto a large one which had driven out to the town gate. Gerda cried a great deal. The winter was long and dark to her. Then the spring came with warm sunshine. I will go and look for Kay, said Gerda. So she went down to the river and got into a little boat that was there, and presently the stream began to carry it away. Perhaps the river will take me to Kay, thought Gerda. She glided down past trees and fields till she came to a large cherry garden, in which stood a little house with strange red and blue windows and a straw roof. Before the door stood two wooden soldiers, who were shouldering arms. Gerda called to them, but they naturally did not answer, and the river carried the boat onto the land. Gerda called out still louder, and there came out of the house a very old woman. She leant upon a crutch and wore a large sun hat, which was painted with the most beautiful flowers. You poor little girl, said the old woman. And then she stepped into the water and brought the boat close in with her crutch and lifted the little girl out of it. And now come and tell me who you are and how you came here, she said. Then Gerda told her everything and asked her if she had seen Kay, but she said he had not passed that way yet, but he would come soon. She told Gerda not to be sad and that she would stay in with her and take in the cherry trees and flowers, which were prettier than any picture book, and they each could tell a story. She then took Gerda's hand and led her into the little house and shut the door. The windows were very high, and the panes were red, blue, and yellow, and so that the light came through in curious colors. On the table were the most delicious cherries, and the old woman let Gerda eat as many as she liked while she combed her hair with a gold comb as she ate. The beautiful sunny hair rippled and shone round the dear little face, which was so soft and sweet. I have always longed to have a dear little girl like you, and you shall see how happy we will be together. And as she combed Gerda's hair, Gerda thought less and less about Kay, for the old woman was a witch. But not a wicked witch, for she only enchanted now and then to amuse herself, and she did not want to keep little Gerda very much. So she went into the garden and waved her stick over the, all the rose bushes and blossoms and all, and they sank down into the black earth, and no one could see where they had gone. The old woman was afraid that if Gerda saw the roses, she would begin to think of her own, and then would remember Kay and run away. Then she led Gerda out into the garden. How glorious it was, and what lovely scents filled the air. All oh, the flowers you can think of blossomed there all year round. Gerda jumped for joy and played there till the sun set behind the tall cherry trees. And then she slept in a beautiful bed with red silk pillows filled with violets. And she slept soundly and dreamed as a queen does on her wedding day. The next day she played again with the flowers in the warm sunshine. So many days had passed by. Gerda knew every flower, and oh, there were so many. It seemed to her that if one were not there, though she could not remember which. 
She was looking one day at the old woman's sun hat, which had the painted flowers on it, and there she saw a rose. The witch had forgotten to make that vanish when she had made all the other roses disappear, and it was difficult to think of everything. Why, there are no roses here, cried Gerda, and she hunted among all the flowers, but not one was to be found. Then she sat down and cried, but her tears fell just on the spot where a rose bush had sunk, and when her warm tears watered the earth, the bush came up with a full bloom just as it had been before. Gerda kissed the roses and thought of lovely roses at home, and with them came the thought of Kay. Oh, what have I been doing? said the little girl. I wanted to look for Kay. She ran to the end of the garden, and the gate was shut, but she pushed against it the rusty lock so that it came open. She ran out with her little bare feet, and no one came after her. At last she could not run any longer, and she sat down on a large stone. When she looked around, she saw that the summer was over. It was late autumn. It had not changed in the beautiful garden where there were sunshine and flowers year-round. Oh dear, how late I have made myself, said Gerda. It's autumn already. I cannot rest. And then she sprang up to run on. Oh, how tired and sore her little feet grew, and it became colder and colder. She had to rest again, and there on the snow in front of her was a large crow. It had been looking at her for some time, and it nodded its head and said, Good day. Then it asked the little girl why she was alone in the world. She told the crow her story and asked if he had seen Kay. The crow nodded very thoughtfully and said, It might be. It might be. What? Do you think you have? cried the little girl, and she almost squeezed the crow to death as she kissed him. <laughs> gently, gently, said the crow. I think. I know I think it might be little Kay, but now he has forgotten you for the princess. Does he live with the princess? asked Greta. Yes, listen, said the crow. And then he told her all he knew. In the kingdom in which we are now sitting lives a princess who is dreadfully clever. She has read all the newspapers in the world and has forgotten them again. She is as clever as that. The other day she came to the throne, and it was not as pleasant as people think. Then she began to say, Why should I not marry? But she wanted a husband who could answer when he was spoken to, not one who would stand stiff fully and look respectable. That would be too dull. When she told all the court ladies, they were delighted. You can believe every word I say, said the groom. I have a tame sweetheart in the palace, and she tells me everything. Of course, the sweetheart was another crow. <laughs> the newspapers came out the next morning with the border of hearts round it, and the princess's monogram on it, and inside you could read every good-looking right and man might come to the palace and speak to the princess, and whoever should speak loud enough to be heard would be well-fed and looked after, and the one who spoke best should become the princess's husband indeed, said the crow. You can quite believe me, it is as true as I am sitting here. Young men came in streams, and there was such a crowd and mixing together, but nothing came of it for the first nor the second day. They could all speak quite well when they were in the streets, but as soon as they came inside the palace door and saw the guards in silver, and upstairs the footmen in gold, and the great hall aisle lighted up, and their wits left them. And when they stood in front of the throne where the princess was sitting, and they could not think of anything to say except to repeat the last word she had spoken, and she did not much care to hear that again. It seemed as if they were walking in their sleep until they came out into the street again, when they could speak once more. There was a rose stretching from the gate to the town up to the castle. They were hungry and thirsty, but the palace they did not even get a glass of water. A few of the cleverest had brought some slices of bread and butter with them, but they did not share them with their neighbor, for they thought, If he looks hungry, the princess will not take him. But what about Kay? asked Greta. When did he come? Was he in the crowd? 
Wait a bit, I'm coming to him. On the third day, a little figure came without a horse or carriage and walked jauntily up to the palace. His eyes shone as yours do, and he had lovely curling hair, but quite poor clothes. That was Kay, cried Greta with delight. Oh, then I have found him. And she clapped her hands. He had a little bundle on his back, said the crow. No, it must have been his skates, for he went away with his skates. Very likely, said the crow. I did not see for certain, but I know for this from my sweetheart. And then he, when he came to the palace door and saw the royal guards in silver, and on the stairs the footmen in gold, he was not the least put out. He nodded to them, saying, It must be rather dull on the stairs. I would rather go inside. The hall was blazed with lights. Counselors and ambassadors were walking about the noiseless shoes carrying gold dishes. It was enough to make him nervous. His boots creaked dreadfully loud, but he was not frightened. That must be Kay, said Gerda. I knew he had new boots on, and I've heard them creaking in his grandmother's room. They did creak, certainly, said the crow. And not one bit afraid, up to the princess he went, who was sitting in a large pearl as round as a spinning wheel. All the ladies in waiting were standing around, each with their attentions, and the lords in waiting with their attendants. The nearer they stood to the door, the prouder they were. It must have been dreadful, said little Gerda. And the king went to princess. Well, I heard from my tame sweetheart that he was merry and quick-witted. He had not come to woo, he said, but to listen to the princess's wisdom. And at the end of it, they fell in love with each other. Oh, yes, that was Kay, said Gerda. He was so clever, and he could do sums with fractions. Oh, lead me to the palace. That's easily said, answered the crow. But how are we to manage that? I must talk it over with the tame sweetheart. She may be able to advise us, for I must tell you that a little girl like you could never get permission to enter it. Yes, I will get in, said Gerda. When Kay hears that I am here, he will come out at once and fetch me. Wait for me by the railings, said the crow, and he nodded his head and flew away. It was late in the evening when he came back. Ah, ah, he said, I am here to give you her love, for here is a little roll for you. She took it out of the kitchen. There is plenty here, and you must be hungry. You cannot come into the palace. The guards in silver and footmen in gold would not allow it. But don't cry. You shall get in all right. My sweetheart knows a little back stairs which leads into the sleeping room, and she knows where to find the key. They went into the garden, and when the lights in the palace were put out one after another, the crow led Gerda to the back door. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with anxiety and longing. It seemed as if she was going to do something wrong, but she only wanted to know if it was little Kay. Yes, it must be. She remembered so well his clever eyes, his curly hair. She could see him smiling as he did when they were home under the rose trees. He would be so pleased to see her and to hear how they were all at home. Now they were on the stairs, a little lamp burning, and on the landing stood the tame crow. She put her head to one side and looked at Gerda, who bowed as her grandmother had taught her. My betrothed told me many nice things about you, my dear lady, she said. Will you take the lamp while I go in front? We can go this way as to meet no one. Through the beautiful rooms they came to the sleeping room. In the middle of it, hung on a thick rod of gold, were two beds, shaped like lilies, one in white, in which lay the princess, and the other in red, in which Gerda hoped to find Kay. She pushed aside the curtain and saw a brown neck. Oh, it was Kay! She called his name out loud, holding the lamp towards him. He woke up, turned his head. It was not Kay. It was only his neck that was like Kay's. But he was young and handsome. The princess sat up in her lily bed and asked who was there. Then Greta cried and told her story and all that the crows had done for her. You poor child, said the princess and princess. They praised the crows and said that they were not angry with them, but they must not do it again. Now they should have a reward. Would you like to fly away free, said the princess, or will you have a permanent place as court crows with which you can get into the kitchen. 
Both girls bowed and asked for the permanent appointment, for they thought of their old age. Kurt's thinking about retirement. As they put Gerda to bed, she folded her hands, thinking, as she fell asleep, How good people and animals are to me. The next day, she was dressed from head to foot in silk and satin. They wanted her to stay on in the palace, but she begged for a little carriage and a horse, and a pair of shoes so that she might go out again and look to the world for Kay. They gave her a muff as well as some shoes. She was warmly dressed when she was ready. There in front of the door stood a coach of pure gold with a coachman, footmen, and postulins with gold crowns on. The prince and princess helped her into the carriage and wished her good luck. A wild crow, who is now married, drove with her for the first three miles. The other crow could not come because she had a headache. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, cried the prince and princess, and little Gerda cried, and the crow cried. When he said goodbye, he flew onto a tree and waved with his black wings as long as the carriage, which shone in the light like a sun, was in sight. And then they came to a dark wood, but the coach lit up like a torch. When the robbers saw it, they rushed, exclaiming, Gold! Gold! They seized the horses, killed the coachman, footmen, and postlins, and dragged Gerda out of the carriage. <laughs> She is plump and tender. We will eat her, said the old robber queen, and drew her long knife, which glittered horribly. You shall not kill her, cried her little daughter. She shall play with me. She shall give me her muff and her beautiful dress and shall sleep in my bed. The little robber girl was as big as Gerda, but was stronger, broader, with dark hair and dark eyes. She threw her arms around Gerda and said, They should not kill you as long as you are not naughty. Aren't you a princess? No, said Gerda, and she told all that had happened to her and how dearly she loved little Kay. The robber girl looked at her very seriously and nodded her head, saying, They should not kill you, even if you are naughty. For then I shall kill you myself. She dried Gerda's eyes and stuck both her hands in her beautiful warm muff. The robber girl took Gerda to the corner of the robber's camp where she slept. All around were more than a hundred wood pigeons which seemed to be asleep, but they moved a little when the two girls came in. There was also, nearby, a reindeer which the robber girl had teased by tickling it with her long sharp knife. Gerda lay awake for some time. Arr, arr, said the wood pigeons. I have seen little Kay, a white bird carried his leg. He was sitting in the Snow Queen's carriage when we drove over the forest when our little ones were in the nest. She breathed on them, and all but two died. Arr, arr. What are you saying over there? cried Gerda. Where was the Snow Queen going? Do you know it all? She was probably traveling to Lapland, where there is always ice and snow. Ask the reindeer. There is capital ice and snow there, said the reindeer. One can jump about there in all the great sparkling valleys. There the Snow Queen has her summer palace, but her best palace is up by the North Pole, on the island called Spitsbergen. Okay, my little Kay, sobbed Gerda. You must lie still, said the little warble girl, or else I shall stick my knife into you. <laughs> In the morning, Gerda told her all that the wood pigeons had said, and she nodded. Do you know where Lapland is? she asked the reindeer. You should know better than I, said the beast, and his eyes sparkled. I was born and bred there in the snow fields. Listen, said the robber girl to Greta. You see, all the robbers have gone. Only my mother has left, and she will fall asleep in the afternoon. Then I will do something for you. When her mother had fallen asleep, the robber girl went up to the reindeer and said, 
I'm going to set you free so that you can run to Lapland, but you must go quickly and carry this little girl to the Snow Queen's palace, where her playfellow is. You must have heard all that she told about, for she spoke loud enough. The reindeer sprang higher from joy. The robber girl lifted little Gerda up and had the foresight to tie her on firmly, and even gave her a little pillow for a saddle. You must have your fur boots, she said, for it will be cold, but I shall keep your muff, for it is cozy. But so that you may not freeze, here are my mother's great fur gloves. They will come up to your elbows. Creep into them. And Gerda cried for joy. Don't make such faces, the little robber girl. You must look very happy, for there are two loaves and a sausage. Now you won't be hungry. They, too, were tied to the reindeer, and the little robber girl opened the door and made all the big dogs come away and cut through the halter with her sharp knife and said to the reindeer, Now run and take great care of this little girl. And Gerda stretched out her hands with her large fur gloves towards the little robber girl and said, Goodbye! When the reindeer flew over the ground through the great forest as fast as he could, wolves howled, ravens screamed, and the sky seemed on fire. Who's my dear, but the light, said the reindeer. See how they shine? And then he ran faster still, day and night. The loaves were eaten, the sausage too, and then they came to Lapland. They stopped by a wretched little house. The roof almost touched the ground, and the door was so low that you had to creep in and out. And there was no one in the house except an old Lapland woman who was cooking fish over an oil lamp. The reindeer told Gerda's whole story, but first he told his own, for that seemed to him much more important. And Gerda was so cold that she could not speak. Oh, you poor creatures, said the Lapland woman. You have still further to go. You must go over a hundred miles into Finland, for there the Snow Queen lives, and every night she burns bingo lights. I will write some words on the dried stockfish, for I have no paper. And you must give it to the Finden woman, for she can give you better advice than I can. And when Gerda was warmed and had something to eat and drink, the Lapland woman wrote on dried stockfish, and begged Gerda to take care of it, and tied Gerda securely on the reindeer's back, and away they went again. The whole night was ablaze with northern lights, and then they came to Finland and knocked at the Finland woman's chimney, for she had no door. Inside it was so hot that the Finland woman wore very few clothes. She loosened Gerda's clothes and drew her fur clothes and boots off. She laid a piece of ice on the reindeer's head, and then read what was written on the stockfish. She read it over three times till she knew it by heart, then put the fish in the saucepan, for she never wasted anything. You're very clever, said the reindeer. I know. Cannot you give the little girl a drink that she might have the strength of twelve men and overcome the Snow Queen? The strength of twelve men, said the Finland woman. That would not help much. Little Kay is with the Snow Queen, and he likes everything there very much, and thinks it is the best place in the world. But that is because he has a splinter of glass in his heart, and a bit in his eye. If these do not come out, he will never be free, and the Snow Queen will keep her power over him. But cannot you give little Gerda something that she can have power over her? I can give her no great power than she already has, but don't you see how great it is? Don't you see how men and beasts must help her when she wanders into the wide world with her bare feet? She is powerful already, because she is a dear little innocent child. If she cannot by herself conquer the Snow Queen, and take away the glass splinters from little Kay, 
We cannot help her. The Snow Queen's garden begins two miles from here. You can carry the little maiden so far, but put her down by the large bush with red berries growing in the snow. Then you must come back here as fast as you can. Then the Finland woman lifted little Gerda on the reindeer, and away he sped. Oh, I've left my gloves and boots behind, cried Gerda. She missed them in the piercing cold, but the reindeer did not dare to stop. On he ran till he came to the bush with red berries. Then he set Gerda down and kissed her mouth, and great big tears ran down his cheeks, and then he ran back. There stood poor Gerda, without shoes or gloves, in the middle of the bitter, bitter cold of Finland. She ran on as fast as she could. A regiment of gigantic snowflakes came against her, but they melted when they touched her, and she went on with fresh courage. And now, we should see what Kay is doing. He was not thinking of Gerda and never dreamt that she was standing outside the palace. The walls of the palace were built of driven snow, and the doors and the windows of piercing winds. There were more than a hundred halls in all its frozen snow. The largest was several miles long. The bright northern lights lit them up, and very large and empty and cold and glittering they were. In the middle of the great hall was a frozen lake which is cracked into a thousand pieces. Each piece was exactly like the other. Here the Snow Queen used to sit when she was at home. Little Kay was almost blue and black with cold, but he did not feel it, for she had kissed away his feelings and his heart was a lump of ice. He was pulling about some sharp, flat pieces of ice and trying to fit one into another. He thought each was most beautiful, but that was because of the splinter of glass in his eye. He fitted them into many great shapes, but he wanted to make them spell the word love. The Snow Queen had said, If you can spell out the word that you shall be your own master, I will give you the whole world. And a new pair of skates. But he could not do it. Now I must fly to warmer countries, said the Snow Queen. I must go and powder my black kettles. This is what she called Mount Etna and Mount Vesuvius. It does the lemons and grapes good. So off she flew, and Kay sat alone in the great hall, trying to do his puzzle. He sat so still that you would have thought that he was frozen. Then it happened that little Gerda stepped into the hall. The biting cold winds became quiet as if they had fallen asleep when she appeared in the great, empty, freezing hall. She caught sight of Kay. She recognized him, and she ran to put her arms around his neck, crying, Kay, dear little Kay, I have found you at last. But he sat quite still and cold. Then Gerda wept hot tears which fell on his neck, and thawed his heart, and swept away the little bit of looking glass. He looked at her, then he burst into tears. He cried so much that the glass splinter swam out of his eye, and then he knew her and cried out, Gerda, my dear little Gerda, where have you been so long? Where have I been? And he looked around him. How cold it is here, how wide and empty! And he threw himself on Gerda, and she laughed and wept for joy. It was such a happy time that the pieces of ice even danced around them for joy. And then when they were tired and lay down again, they formed themselves into the letters that the Snow Queen said he must spell in order to become his own master, and have the whole world and a new pair of skates. And Gerda kissed his cheeks, and they grew rosy. She kissed his eyes, and they sparkled like hers. She kissed his hand and his feet, and they became warm and glowing. The Snow Queen might come home now. His release, the word love, stood written in sparkling ice. 
They took each other's hands and wandered out of the great palace. They talked about the grandmother and the roses on the leads. Whenever they came, the winds hushed and the sun came out. When they reached the bush with the red berries, there stood the reindeer waiting for them. He carried Kay and Gerda first to the Finland woman, who warmed them in her hot room and gave them advice for their journey home. Then they went to the Lapland woman, who gave them new clothes and mended their sleigh. The reindeer ran with him until they came to the green, fresh fields with spring green, and here he said goodbye. They came to the forest, which was bursting into bud, and out of it came a splendid horse, which Gerda knew. It was the first which had drawn the gold coach ridden by a young girl with a red cap and pistols on her belt. It was a little robber girl who was tired of being home and wanted to go out to the world. She and Gerda knew each other at once. You're a nice fellow, she said to Kay. I would like to know if you deserve to be run over all around the world. But Gerda patted her cheeks and asked after the prince and princess. They're traveling about, said the robber girl. And the crow? asked Gerda. Oh, the crow is dead answered the robber girl. The same sweetheart is a widow and hops about a bit with a big black crepe around her leg. She makes a great fuss, but that's all nonsense. But tell me what happened to you and how you caught him. And Kay and Gerda told her all. Dear, dear, said the robber girl, and shook both her hands, and promised that if she came to their town, she would come and see them. Then she rode on. But Gerda and Kay went home hand in hand, and they found out grandmother and everything had just been... But they then went through the doorway and found they were grown up. There were roses on the leads. It was summer, warm, glorious summer. Okay. So somehow... Frozen came out of that? I don't see it. <laughs> Other than having a snow queen. That's it. Glass heart turned into ice? Yeah. Warm embrace having to break it? Maybe. But it has nothing to do with the movie Frozen. I guess if they follow the original story, but, you know, since when does Disney do that? Let's see, how long is this next one? Because it is 10.38. Okay, this one's only nine pages. I'll go and read it. <clears throat> so, our final tale for this fabulous Friday night of fairy tales. Also, by Hans Christian Andersen, The Fir Tree. There was once a pretty little fir tree in the wood. It was in a capital position, for it could get sun, and there was enough air, and all around grew plenty of tall companions, both pines and firs. It did not need the warm sun and the fresh air, or lotus little peasant children who ran about chattering when they came out to gather wild strawberries and raspberries. Often they found a whole basket full and strung raspberries on a straw. They would sit down by the little fir tree and say, What a pretty little one this is! The tree did not like that at all. By the next year it had grown a whole ring taller. And the year after that, another ring more, for you can always tell a fir tree's age from its rings. Oh, if I were only as great as the others, sighed the little fir tree, then I could stretch out my branches far and wide and look out to the great world. The birds would build their nests in my branches, and when the wind blew, I would bow to it politely, just like the others. It took no pleasure in the sunshine, nor in the birds, nor in the rose-colored clouds that sailed over at dawn and sunset. Then the winter came, 
and the snow lay white and sparkling all around, and a hare would come and spring right over the little fir tree, which annoyed it very much. But then two more winters had passed, and the fir tree was so tall that the hare had to run around it. Ah, uh, to grow, to grow, and to become great and old, that is the only pleasure in life, thought the tree. In the autumn, the woodcutters used to come and hew some of the tallest trees. This happened every year, and the young fir tree would shiver as the magnificent trees fell crashing, crackling to the ground, the branches hewn off and the great trunks left bare, so that they were almost unrecognizable. But then they were laid on wagons and dragged out of the wood by horses. Where are they going? What will happen to them? In the spring, when the swallows and storks came, the fir tree asked them, Do you know where they are taken? Have you met them? The swallows knew nothing of them, but the stork nodded his head thoughtfully and saying, I think I know. I have met many new ships as I fly through Egypt. There were splendid masts on the ships. I'll wager those were they. They had a scent of fir trees. Ah, those are grand, grand. Oh, if I were only big enough to sail away over the sea, too. What sort of thing is the sea? What does it look like? Oh, it would take much too long to tell you all that, said the stork. And off he went. Rejoice in your youth, said the sunbeams. Rejoice in the sweet growing time and the young life within you. And the wind kissed it, and the dew wept tears over it. But the fir tree did not understand. Towards Christmas time, quite little trees were cut down, some not as big as a young fir tree, or just the same age. And now it had no peace of rest for longing to be away. These little trees, which were chosen for their beauty, kept all of their branches. But they were put in carts and drawn out of the woods by horses. Where are those going? asked the fir tree. They're no bigger than I. And one there is much smaller, even. Where do they keep their branches? Where are they being taken to? We know, we know, twittered the sparrows. Down there in the city, they have peeped in the windows. We know where they go. They attain to the greatest splendor and magnificence you can imagine. We have looked in the windows and seen them planted in the middle of a warm room adorned with many beautiful things. Golden apples, sweet meats, toys, and hundreds of candles. And then asked the fir tree, trembling in every limb with eagerness. And then, what happens then? Oh, we haven't seen anything more than that. That was simply matchless. Am I too destined to be the same brilliant career? wondered the fir tree excitedly. That is even better than sailing over the sea. I am sick with longing, if only it were Christmas. Now I am tall and grown up like those which were taken away last year. Oh, if I were only in a cart, if I were only in a warm room with all the splendor and magnificence, and then, then something better, something still more beautiful. Why else should they dress up? There must be something great or something grander to come. But what? Oh, I am pining away. I don't really know what's the matter with me. Pining. <laughs> Rejoice in us, said the wind and sunshine. Rejoice in your fresh youth and the free air. But the fir tree took no notice and just grew and grew. There it stood fresh and green in winter and summer, and all who saw it said, What a beautiful tree! And at Christmas time, it was the first to be cut down. The axe went deep into the pith. The tree fell to the ground with a groan. It felt bruised and faint. It could not think of happiness. It was sad it was leaving its home, the spot where it had sprung up. It knew, too, that it would never again see its dear old companions, or the little shrubs and flowers, perhaps not even the birds. Altogether, the parting was not pleasant. When the tree came to itself again, it was packed in a yard with other trees, and a man was saying, well, This is a splendid one. 
We shall only want this. Then two footmen in livery carried the fir tree up to a large, beautiful room. There were pictures hanging on the walls, and near a Dutch stove stood a great Chinese vases with lions on their lids. There were armchairs, silk-covered sofas, big tables laden with picture books and toys, worth hundreds of pounds at least. So the children said. The fir tree was placed in a great tub filled with sand, but no one could see that it was a tub, for it was all hung with greenery and stood on a grey carpet. Oh, how the tree trembled! What was coming now? On its branches were hung little nets cut out of coloured paper, each full of sugar plums, gilt apples, and nuts hung down as if they were growing. Over a hundred red, blue, and white tapers were fastened along the branches. Dolls as lifelike as human beings. The fir tree had never seen any before. Were suspended among green, and right up to the top was fixed a gold tinsel star. It was gorgeous, quite unusually gorgeous. Tonight, they all said, tonight it will be lighted. Ah, said the tree, if only it were evening, then the tapers would soon be lighted. What will happen then? I wonder whether the trees will come from the wood to see me, or if the sparrows will fly against the window panes. Am I to stand out here decked as thus nothing in winter and summer? It was not a bad guess, but the fir tree had a real bark ache from the sheer longing, and the bark ache in trees is just as bad as a headache in us human beings. Now the tapers were lighted. What a glitter, what splendor! The tree quivered in all its branches so much that one of the candles caught the green and singed it. Ah, uh, care! cried the young ladies, and they extinguished it. Now the tree did not even dare to quiver. It was really terrible. It was so afraid of losing any of its ornaments, and it was quite bewildered by all the radiance. And then the folding doors were opened, and a crowd of children rushed in as though they wanted to knock down the whole tree, whilst the older people followed soberly. The children stood quite silent, but only for a moment, and then they shouted again and danced around the tree and snatched off the presents one after another. "'What are they doing?' thought the tree. "'What is going to happen?' And the tapers burnt low on the branches, and were put out one by one, and then the children were given permission to plunder the tree. They rushed in at all, and all the boughs creaked. If it had not been fastened by a gold star at the top of the ceiling, it would have been overthrown. The children danced about with their splendid toys, and no one looked at the tree, except the old nurse, who came and peeped among the boughs as if to see if a figure, Apple, had been left behind. "'A story! A story!' cried the children, and dragged a little stout man to the tree. He sat down beneath it, saying, "'Here we are in the greenwood, and the tree will be delighted to listen. But I am only going to tell one story. Shall it be Henny Penny or Humpty Dumpty who fell downstairs?' and yet gained great honor and married a princess. Henny Penny, cried some. Humpty Dumpty, cried the others. There was a wonderful babble of voices. Only the fir tree kept silent and thought, Am I n not to be in it? Am I to have nothing to do with it? But it had already been it, played out its part. The old man told them about Humpty Dumpty, who fell downstairs and married a princess. The children clapped their hands and cried, Another! Another! They wanted the story of Henny Penny also, but they only got Humpty Dumpty. The fir tree stood quite astonished and thoughtful. The birds in the woods had never related anything like that. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs and yet married a princess? Yes, that is the way of the world, thought the tree. And we're sure it must be true, because such a nice man told the story. Well, who knows? Perhaps I shall fall downstairs and marry a princess. And he rejoiced to think that the next day he would be decked out again in candles, toys, and glittering ornaments and fruit. Tomorrow I shall quiver with excitement. I shall enjoy the full of my splendor. Tomorrow I shall hear Humpty Dumpty again, and perhaps Henny Penny too. And the tree stood silent lost in thought, or 
all through the night. Next morning, the servants came in. Now the dressing up will begin again, thought the tree. But they dragged it out of the room and up the stairs to the lumber room and put it in a dark corner where no ray of light could penetrate. What does this mean? thought the tree. What am I to do here? What is there for me to hear? And it leaned against the wall and thought and thought. And there was time enough for that, for days and nights went by, and no one came. At last, when someone did come, it was only to put some great boxes in the corner. Now the tree was quite covered. It seems as if it had been quite forgotten. And now it is winter outdoors, thought the fir tree. The ground is hard and covered with snow. They can't plant me yet. And that is why I'm staying here under cover till spring comes. How thoughtful they are. Only I wish it was not so terribly dark and lonely in here. Not even a little hair. It was so nice out in the wood, when the snow lay all around and the hare leapt past me. Yes, even when he leapt over me. But I didn't like it then. It's so dreadfully lonely up here. Sweet, sweet, said a little mouse, stealing out, followed by a second. They sniffed at the fir tree and then crept through its boughs. It's frightfully cold, said the little mice. How nice it is to be here. Don't you think so too, old, old fir tree? I'm not at all old, said the tree. There are many more trees older than I am. Where did you come from? asked the mice. And what do you know? They were extremely inquisitive. Tell us about the most beautiful place in the world. Is that where you came from? Have you been to the storefront where the cheese lies on the shelves and hams hang on the ceiling? Or one of the dances with tallow candles? And where one goes to thin and comes out fat? I know nothing about that, said the tree. But I know the wood where the sun shines and the bird sings. And then it told them all about its young days, and the little mice had never heard anything like that before. And they listened with all their ears and said, Oh, wow, you have seen so much. How lucky you've been. I said the fir tree. And then I thought over what it had told them. Yes, on the whole, those were very happy times. But then it went on to tell them about Christmas Eve and what was adorned with sweetmeats and tapers. Oh, said the little mice. How lucky you've been, you old fir tree. I'm not at all old, said the tree. I only came from the woods this winter. I'm only a little backward, perhaps, in my growth. How beautifully you tell stories, said the little mice. And the next evening they came with four others, who wanted to hear the tree's story. And it told still more, for it remembered everything so clearly and thought, Those were happy times, but they may come again. Humpty Dumpty fell down the stairs, and yet he married a princess. Perhaps I shall also marry a princess. And then it thought of a pretty little birch tree that grew out in the wood and seemed to a fir tree as a real princess, and a very beautiful one, too. Who is Humpty Dumpty? asked the little mice. And then the tree told the whole story. They could remember every single word, and the little mice were ready to leap on the topmost branch out of sheer joy. The next night, many more mice came, and on Sunday, even two rats, but they did not care about the stories. That had trouble with the little mice, for now they thought less of it too. Is that the only story you know? asked the rats. The only one, answered the tree. I heard that on my happiest evening, but I did not realize then how happy I was. That's a very poor story. Don't you know the one about the bacon and towel candles, the storeroom story? No. Then we are much obliged to you, said the rats, and then they went to meet their friends. At last, the little mice went off also, and the tree said, sighing, Really, it was very pleasant when the little lively mice sat around and listened whilst I told them stories. But now that's over too. But now I think of the time when I shall be brought out again, to keep up my spirits. But when did that happen? Well... It was one morning when they came to tidy up the lumber room, and they really threw it rather roughly to the floor, but a servant dragged it off at once downstairs, where it was in daylight once more. 
Now life begins again, thought the tree. It felt the fresh air and the first rays of sun, and there it was out in the yard. Everything passed so quickly, the tree f quite forgot to notice itself. There was so much to look at all around. The yard opened to a full garden of flowers. The roses were so fresh and sweet, hanging over a little trellis, and the lime trees were in blossom, and the swallows flew about saying, my husband has come home. But it was not what the fir tree they meant. Now I shall live, thought the three joyfully, stretching out its branches wide, but alas, they were all withered and yellow, and it was lying in a corner among weeds and nettles. The gold star was still on its highest bough, and it glittered in the bright sunlight. In the yard, some of the merry children were playing, who had danced so gaily on the tree at Christmas. One of the little ones ran up and tore off the gold star. Look what was left on the old fir, ugly fir tree! It cried and stamped the boughs as though they cracked under his feet. And the tree looked up at all the splendor and freshness of the flowers in the garden, then looked at itself and wished it had been left dying in the dark corner of the lumber room. It thought of its fresh youth in the wood, of the very merry Christmas Eve, and the little mice who had listened so happily to the story of Humpty Dumpty. Too late, too late, thought the old tree. If only I had enjoyed myself whilst I could. Now all was over and gone. But the servant came and cut the tree into small pieces. There were quite a bundle of them, and they flickered brightly under the great copper in the brewing house. The tree sighed deeply, and each sigh was like a pistol shot. So the children who were playing there ran up and sat in front of the fire gazing at it and crying, Piff! Puff! Bang! But for each report, which was really a sigh, the tree was thinking of summer's day in the wood, or of a winter's night out there, and when the stars were shining. A thought of Christmas Eve and of Humpty Dumpty, which was the only story it had heard or could tell. And then the tree burnt away. The children played on in the garden, and the youngest had the golden star on his breast, which the tree had worn on the happiest evening of its life. And now that was past and the tree had passed away. And the story, too, all ended and done with. And that's the way with all stories. <clears throat> and that is our last story for the night. If you see anyone on, or if anyone's here that might recommend a raid for us, I do know someone who's streaming that might raid her. Because it is Legacy Bookish's anniversary slash birthday. So I may just raid her. I'm not going to do a normal raid message, just happy stream anniversary. Ouch. <laughs> I did a really interesting one. <laughs> About happy stream and birthery. <laughs> okay. But yeah, just copy that one. I uh, think that's... You can unlock that emote, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, let's raid Legacy. Uh, thank you again for coming in tonight, and I hope you enjoyed my wonderful fairy tales. But for now, I hope you all have a good evening, wonderful sleep, and nice dreams. And I'll hopefully see you next Thursday, if not sooner. Night. Say your prayers, little one. Don't forget, my son, to include everyone. Tuck you in, warm within, keep you free from sin, till the Sandman he comes. Sleep with one eye open, gripping your pillow tight. Exit light, 
end her night.